Welcome to the second module in this educational series where we will look at donors and donation. Donors may number thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions. Such numbers can overwhelm those responsible for their recruitment and management. In this module, we will learn to think about donors in a structured way and explore how doing so can help construct effective strategies. These strategies may be generic or target specific groups such as young or female donors. We will look at some theoretical models that help understand the drivers that underpin donating behavior. Listed here are the desired learning outcomes for this module. Please revisit at the end of this video to check your new understanding. In very few other fields of endeavor, do organizations have to work so hard to secure their raw materials? In competitive markets, suppliers will generally compete on the basis of price, quality, service, or some other factor, and money will be paid to the chosen provider in exchange for their product. For reasons already discussed, this cannot be the way blood establishments secure supplies of blood. Instead, they must persuade thousands, sometimes millions of individuals to undergo a procedure that may have a cost in terms of time, discomfort, or well-being. Economists will not recognize this as rational behavior. Donors are, in effect, suppliers we need to treat like customers to secure initial participation and then repeat donation. Why they choose to do so and how we can encourage this behavior is the subject of this module. We have already looked broadly at the ISBT Code of Ethics. Let's consider this again here with specific reference to its guidance in relation to donors. ISBT defines a donor as any person who voluntarily gives blood or blood components, though in the context of resource-poor countries, we probably need to expand this definition to include family replacement donors. ISBT cites two broad ethical principles relating to donors, autonomy and dignity and non-maleficence, with this latter term referring to doing no unnecessary or unreasonable harm. Looking first at autonomy, we can see that this deals with issues around consent and confidentiality. The required information is generally provided by means of a form to be signed by the donor. Autonomy may need to be considered slightly differently for those given for the benefit of family or friends. These donors may feel their freedom to not donate is significantly reduced. In terms of dignity and non-maleficence, the key consideration is the responsibility to inform the donor if the blood service becomes aware of information regarding the donor's health, for example, through screening and confirmatory tests. It is also worth noting that, although confidentiality is important, it may be helpful to the recruiter in some circumstances to introduce donor and recipient, for example, uniting a recipient of many units with their group of donors if agreeable to all parties, can result in helpful publicity. In the United States, many blood centers use a tool called Thank the Donor. This enables patients or their loved ones to send anonymous messages to the donor of the actual unit or units used to treat them. Use of ISBT-128 or similar barcode labeling standard is a prerequisite. Further detail can be found online. There are various ways of thinking about donors, namely their demographic characteristics, the way in which they behave, and the attitudes they hold. These can be considered separately or together. This introduces the concept of segmentation. This involves thinking about donors in certain ways based on one or more shared characteristics. It follows that there is no single way of approaching donor segmentation because, depending on the cluster of characteristics under consideration, donors can fall into many segments. Art meets science in this area. Regardless of the sophistication of any information systems, blood services will generally hold some minimal level of information on donors. However, in some low- and middle-income countries, analyzing this in any meaningful way may be difficult. For example, where there is a reliance on card-based approaches to data capture and storage. This is true of both demographics and behaviors. Each can be observed and recorded and theoretically, at least, this information can be used to positively influence future donation activity. Attitudes are arguably a more difficult concept because they cannot be observed, only researched or inferred. However, attitudes are considered to be a much more fundamental driver of whether an individual decides to donate and whether they continue or not with this behavior. In the coming slides, demographic, behavioral, and attitudinal aspects of donors will all be discussed. 
we have previously identified three distinct donor categories, voluntary non-remunerated, family replacement, and paid. In the context of the last slide, and assuming an individual has a choice in which sort of donor to become, this will result from an interaction of demographic, behavioral, and motivational considerations. We note at this point that there is a fourth donor type that could be considered that of the component donor. However, hemophrisis is not common in resource-poor settings because of the high cost of the equipment and consumables required for specific red cell, plasma, or platelet donation. Therefore, this will not feature in our discussion. While the undesirability of paid donation is well established, there is some evidence that the first-time family replacement donor given to support the blood needs of a loved one is as safe as a first-time volunteer donor who is given to support a stranger. However, it should be well understood that a regular repeat donor is far safer than both. This has two implications for those in the recruitment department. The first is that where family replacement donation is a feature of the healthcare system, every effort should be made to convert the family replacement donor to become a regular volunteer donor. The second is that at least as much focus should be paid on retaining existing donors as on recruiting new donors. In some organizations, this may not be explicitly devolved as a responsibility. And of course, there are factors influencing whether a donor returns that are outside the control of the recruitment department. But in most well-functioning blood services, recruiters will act as donor champions, highlighting to other departments what is required to make the donation experience easy and pleasant. For the rest of our discussion, we shall concentrate on issues relating to the volunteer donor. It may be helpful at this stage to consider the donation process, as without this understanding, it is difficult to think clearly about how donors differ from each other, but also over time, as their career as a blood donor develops. The process is also the context in which donors exhibit behaviors, so the two must be thought of together. This graphic is adapted from a manual produced by the Domain Project, or Donor Management in Europe. In red can be seen the steps taken by the donor towards a successful donation. In gray are the management processes the blood service brings to bear to facilitate that successful outcome. In white can be seen possible undesirable outcomes that will prevent a successful donation. The first-time donor will go through a recruitment phase following a successful donation. The donor will sit in the donor base until expiration of the mandatory deferral interval, following which they will be eligible to give again. The blood service challenge is now one of retention. Over time, the donor will ideally be kept in a virtuous cycle around the pathway indicated by the arrows, attending as planned and avoiding donation pitfalls in order to make a successful donation. Many donors will do this for years or even decades, embedding blood donation as a key aspect of their lifestyle and even personal identity. Finally, in black is where donors will eventually end up as a stopped donor. This may be due to permanent deferral, retirement due to age ineligibility, or some serious life event. The potential lifetime value of a donor will obviously depend on age at the time of recruitment. To begin to appreciate how donors may sit at different stages in the donation cycle and be considered at different points on the short-term or lifetime relationship with blood donation, it is helpful to have some common definitions. In reality, most organizations will have developed their own definitions for what they may consider to be, for example, recruited or lapsed donors. However, an attempt was made in Europe to standardize some of these definitions so that data could be compared between countries and relative performance benchmarked and improved. These definitions are presented on this slide. It is quite complex, so you may want to pause the video at this point to take in the detail. This alternative visual presentation may assist with your understanding. It may also help you appreciate how and where the sibling disciplines of recruitment and retention should be applied. Although regular has been adopted as the terminology in Europe, many prefer the US term, repeat donor. This recognizes that, in fact, there may be nothing regular about donation patterns where period of consistent donation may be punctuated by career breaks. How does thinking about donor types and donor behavior help us? One way is in suggesting strategies and actions that are most likely to impact positively on the particular donor type. Some of these are identified here. Applying these interventions to every donor may be wasteful of resource or, in some cases, positively harmful. For example, 
you may wish to consider creating a nursery strategy that takes into account a donor's need for information and reassurance during their first few donations, the period when donors are most likely to lapse. As part of this strategy, you may, for example, decide you will routinely take more time to explain the process in great detail so that the donor knows what to expect. This will likely be appreciated by those who are unfamiliar with it. However, doing this to well-established donors will seem unnecessary and possibly even patronizing. How many donors a blood service has at its disposal to meet patient need is critical information, but without appreciating that donors exist at different stages. Any raw number is largely meaningless. For example, a regular donor may have a very high probability of giving again and an inactive donor a very low probability. Also, high rates of attrition will be seen among first-time donors. All donors are not equal. So, if a simple headcount of donors does not provide much indication of the health and vitality of the donor database, what does? One approach is to adapt an often used commercial model where you consider the recency and frequency of each donor with recency in our case being the time since last donation and frequency a count of the number of units given. The logic is that if you have given many times and last did so recently, it is highly probable that you will give again soon. On the other hand, if you have only made one donation and have not given again for a year or two, it is quite unlikely, though not impossible, that you will be returning to make a second. By modeling in this way, Quite powerful predictions can be made about what size of donor base is required. It can also help direct activity so that tailored communications are directed to relevant groups or segments, that is, those donors who share similar characteristics. Demography is defined as the statistical study of populations, especially human beings, listed as some of the characteristics by which you can classify and segment your donor base. They vary in terms of usefulness. Geographic location is obviously important since to have a viable collection event, you need to have a critical mass of donors with reasonable access to the venue. Marital status, on the other hand, may have little or no bearing on the propensity to donate. In many settings, higher levels of education and income and elevated professional and social standing all index positively with how likely people are to become and stay donors. It is not entirely clear why this is the case. It may be that these factors create differences in awareness or, alternatively, especially in poorer countries or those with large disparities in wealth. This can be considered in the context of Maslow's hierarchy of needs pictured. People who are struggling to feed themselves or are concerned about personal safety may not have the time or capacity to reflect on and support the needs of others. Age is interesting since, as already mentioned, potential lifetime value will diminish with each passing year. Younger donors may be able to give 100 or more donations, someone in middle age less than half that. However, in certain localities, there is evidence that although older people may be harder to convince to try donating blood, once they have begun, then their more settled lifestyle encourages them to keep at it. Younger people, by contrast, may be willing to experiment with donation as part of a youthful process of gathering life experiences but their more chaotic lifestyles may make regular donation challenging. A typical pattern may be to see younger donors take time out but then re-engage later in life, though this of course will vary greatly and every donor journey will be different. We will now look at examples of how different blood services have tried to draw attitudinal factors into the segmentation of their donor base. The definition shown here which describes the process of attitudinal segmentation, gives some clue as to why this approach is not much witnessed in low-resource countries. Therefore, of necessity, examples will draw from practice in Europe and the United States. While the specifics may not be directly transferable, the approach and general insights should prove helpful. Here is an approach developed by a major blood center in the United States. Research led them to describe four attitudinal segments they named Reluctance, Efficiency, Resistance, and Participants. Over the next few slides, we will look at the insights that flowed from this analysis and the implication for the marketing approach. There is a group of donors who seek an enjoyable experience. They named this group Participants. Participants like people and the chance to connect with them, but they also like the nature of the blood donation cause. 
They tend to be younger and respond well to incentives and recognition items. To emphasize again, you may in your setting not be able to specifically identify individuals, but you will certainly have donors with this set of attitudes and knowing how best to cater for their needs will help you plan activities. For this group, this includes enabling connections and positively acknowledging their behaviors. For example, by posting pictures and number of donations online or physically in a donation center. This is the so-called wall of fame approach. Efficients are time pressured and although they recognize the value of blood donation, they are only likely to engage if doing so is made quick and easy for them. This means that operations have to be structured in such a way that queuing is minimized and the promise of a quick and easy process can be honored. As the name suggests, this group engages with donation reluctantly. It is important that they trust your organization. So all of the visual cues, such as an organized process and clean environment, are important, as is the perception of the blood services brand. Testimonials from blood donors that speak of donation as safe and painless will give reassurance and patient stories can help provide the motivation to overcome fears. A similar approach should be adopted to communicate and persuade those classed as resistance. This group is not naturally interested in blood donation and considerable effort will be required to bring it to their attention as a cause, emphasizing how little of their time and effort is required to have such a huge impact. That is, to save a human life may be persuasive. On this slide, we map the U.S. donor segmentation just discussed and compare this with four segments of non-donors identified by a European blood service. Although the research from which these segments were derived was conducted at different times and on different continents, the similarities are striking with only the U.S. participants and European segment 8 misaligned. It is also interesting that the same considerations apply to donors as to non-donors. It is simply that for donors, the concerns they have as members of that group have been sufficiently well addressed for them as individuals that they move from one camp into another. We now look more broadly at behavior change. Like many agencies, blood services use social marketing campaigns to try to influence the behavior of individuals and groups for some defined public good. In our case, it is to adopt a new behavior that of blood donation. It is helpful to look for insights from social psychological theory and behavioral economics. Their models help provide us with a deeper understanding of human behavior. People like to believe that they exercise freedom of choice. The reality, however, is that we are all susceptible to a wide array of influences that will affect our behaviors. There are many models that try to describe this and we shall look at a few. Be aware that models are, by their nature, simplifications of reality. All blood services recognize the need to provide the public with information about the importance of blood donation. The IDA model assumes stages in behavioral change and that without creating awareness and then interest, there can be no eventual progression to a desire to engage in donation and then the final step of actually doing so. However, this very simple model does not account for the fact that knowledge and awareness are rarely enough by themselves to bring about behavioral change. Here, we consider some of these complicating factors. The intention behavior gap describes those situations where a person holds value that are inconsistent with their behaviors. For example, most people will agree on the need to save the planet from environmental catastrophe, but relatively few take any of the necessary actions. Cognitive dissonance refers to the internal conflict created when a person holds two inconsistent views, and so they alter how much credence they attach to one of these beliefs. For example, a smoker may know that smoking is bad for them, so they will either quit or find a way to justify their habit. For example, by saying that it helps keep them slim, or they knew someone who smoked 30 cigarettes a day and lived to be 100. For a prospective blood donor who feels they should donate, they may excuse themselves from doing so using reasons such as they won't want my blood, I had jaundice as a baby. Self-efficacy describes the belief that you can actually do something. 
For instance, fear of fainting in a public environment may put many people off. They need assurance that the vast majority of people donate problem-free. Heuristics refers to the mental shortcuts we all use. In a blood context, it suggests, for example, that public relations activity should be used to promote stories of lives being saved through blood donation. In this way, when faced with an opportunity to donate, the images pulled up to make a shortcut decision will be positive ones. Biases prevent us from being entirely rational. Framing is critically important. That is, the choice that is eventually made is highly influenced by how information is presented. For example, consider the following two requests. Would you like to give blood today? Or alternatively, would you like to save a life today? Which are people likely to find most appealing? Emotions can work for and against the donor recruiter positively by presenting a compelling picture of the patient waiting to be helped. You might elicit empathy, for example. More negatively, if the thought of needles triggers fear, this is problematic, but few individuals will not have some trepidation about needles, however, and the challenge is to make the reward of saving a life so compelling as to overcome such fears. Interpersonal influences are important in blood donation. Social influence can be looked at from several perspectives. Social norms are the group rules that determines what is deemed acceptable behavior. They can vary by continent, by country, or even from school to school. There are two types. These are descriptive norms, or what most people do, and injunctive or moral norms, what individuals feel they ought to do. That is, what behavior is approved by a group. There are various implications for our recruitment strategies that flow from this. Firstly, peer-to-peer -peer approaches are likely to be effective the Peer Promoters Program is discussed in the module on youth engagement, but generally, individuals will be more trusting of messages that emanate from within their group. Secondly, positive testimonials, either from patients or donors, will be effective in showing that blood donation is approved of by society. Thirdly, using respected figures or opinion leaders to deliver messages will be effective. So, recruit such individuals as ambassadors. Finally, it is good practice to use PR techniques to generate news stories to normalize donation in the minds of the public. Regarding social proof, people fear exclusion from their group and will generally act in a way that is consistent with its values. But it is not always obvious what the right answer is, and people will look for social proof before acting. For example, if there is food at a party, people may not be sure whether it is acceptable to help themselves as soon as the first person does so. Others will quickly follow since the behavior has now been shown to be acceptable to the group. So, a key consideration for non-donors will be what they believe friends and family will think of them for giving blood. Therefore, key for the donor recruiter is, once again, to normalize this behavior. But beware the risks of unintended consequences. In social psychology, this is referred to as the boomerang effect or theory of psychological resistance. Many blood services will highlight how few people give blood, citing perhaps we need more donors, less than 1% of our citizens give blood. On the face of it, highlighting shortage is a sensible course of action, but the mind of the potential donor may question why so few people do it. Is it safe? Who are these strange individuals who decide to do this odd thing when 99% of people do not? To overcome this risk, consider using numbers more than percentages Join the 50,000 people who give blood on a regular basis, for example. Sounds as if the donor will be joining an established social movement. Similarly, getting testimonials from actual donors who the prospective donor will identify with as being like him or her can be effective. This provides the social proof that donation is mainstream activity engaged in by normal people. It may be worth asking at this point, are donors altruistic? which is a term often applied to them in recognition of the good they do for society. Altruism can be defined as an unselfish regard for or devotion to the welfare of others at a personal cost. So, altruism implies a disregard for oneself, but studies have indicated that donors may benefit from the act of donation in a number of different ways. These may be closely related to their motivations for donating in the first instance. Consequently, blood donation should more properly be described as a benevolent behavior. To reinforce the point that donation offers something of value to the donor, 
This slide presents an alternative European approach to segmentation, differentiating donors by motivation. There is one overarching factor described by the researchers as love, power, and giving. There are then a number of distinct motivational clusters described as social currency, gravitation to medicine, personal integrity as my identity, organization as club or caste, and magical thinking. All of these areas imply that the donor is getting value in exchange for his or her blood, reinforcing the conclusion that the act of donation is benevolent rather than altruistic. Your attention is drawn to the paragraph to the right of the arrow, which should help further in understanding the role of segmentation in blood donor management. The theory of planned behavior is a model that incorporates some of the factors just discussed. The attitude towards the behavior is driven by two factors, belief about the outcome and the evaluation of it. For example, under belief, the consideration may be, I will save a life, but it will probably hurt. Under evaluation, we might have, is this a good trade-off? The subjective norm, so-called by psychologists, is a second influence of intention. This is how socially acceptable or important a person perceives that significant others in their lives believe the behavior to be. It is fortunate that blood donation is generally viewed favorably, but this is not necessarily the case with all forms of giving. Consider sperm donation, for example. Perceived behavioral control is the third influencer. How easy is performing the behavior in question? And do you think yourself capable? These are helpful insights, though the model is less strong on moving from intention to behavior. However, if you can convince the donor to commit to some element of a plan, there is evidence that this can be helpful in bridging this gap. For example, by asking them to book an appointment or providing a map of how to find a venue. A more contemporary approach is the behavior change wheel. The BCW was developed from 19 frameworks of behavior change identified in a systematic literature review. It consists of three layers. The hub identifies the sources of the behavior that could prove fruitful targets for intervention. It uses the COM-B model, namely capability, opportunity, motivation, and behavior. This model recognizes that behavior is part of an interacting system involving all these components. Interventions need to change one or more of them in such a way as to put the system into a new configuration and minimize the risk of its reverting. Surrounding the hub is a layer of nine intervention functions to choose from based on the particular COM-B analysis one has undertaken. The outer layer, the rim of the wheel, identifies seven policy categories that can support the delivery of these intervention functions. Please use these prompts to help you reflect on what you have learned. In Module 3, we will look in more detail at transfusion-transmitted infections and donor counseling.